Hi there. Um, I'm really sorry I can't be here with you personally today. Unfortunately, I've got a medical procedure on Monday uh, and had to start taking my pre-op meds yesterday evening, um, which has left me completely unable to be more than a few seconds um, away from the bathroom. So apologies for that. Um, anyway, when Dominic first mentioned to me last year that he was pulling this conference together, I was still doing my diploma um, uh, in gender and sexual diversity therapy and was working on my dissertation um, which was around safeguarding issues for trans and um, gender variant children and young people uh, as well as being a counsellor um, and a volunteer youth worker with uh, um, emergent trans young people I'm also a trainer for the charity Victim Support uh, and have a background of working with both young and um, adult offenders uh, as well as being also a trans man myself now you may, may remember reports in the news early last year about a young trans man in Scotland, Chris Wilson, who had found himself charged with the offence of obtaining sexual intimacy by fraud, having had sex with a girl who it turned out had only been 15 years old at the time, although she had told him um, she was 16. He was 21. Chris ended up entering a guilty plea at uh, Edinburgh High Court, uh, was facing a lengthy prison sentence and uh, possible life on the sex offenders register. Um, he wasn't actually charged on account of the girl being underage. Now the case sent shockwaves um, around the trans community and the Scottish Transgender Alliance very quickly began petitioning and campaigning over the issue. For me personally, like many other trans people, I was deeply alarmed and distressed about the enormous implications this case had um, for trans people of all ages um, who did not reveal the gender that they were assigned at birth to their sexual partners. But as both an experienced youth worker and as a counsellor I was particularly aware of the issues that this posed for um, adolescent young people who were emerging into their trans identities. Now Chris Wilson ended up being saved from jail. He ended up with a three-year probation order, 240 hours community service and instead of a lifetime on the sex offenders register, he will be on it for three years. The judge in the case did at least see that Chris's transgender status was a mitigating factor when it came to sentencing. Had Chris been able to receive appropriately trans-aware legal counsel before he entered a plea in court, who knows if this might have been, um, uh, if he would have been convicted in the resulting trial, we'll never know. And no sooner as the Wilson case had hit the headlines in Scotland, another very similar case hit the tabloids in England with that of Justine McNally. Now there were differences between Scottish and English law um, and in England um, McNally was prosecuted under the Sexual Offences Act of 2003, charged with six counts of assault by penetration on account of consent being vitiated um, uh, on the basis that they deceived their girlfriend about their gender. At the time of the alleged offences, McNally was 17 years old and their girlfriend was 16. Now, assault by penetration is a very serious criminal offence. It carries the same maximum prison sentence as rape, which is maximum life. Indeed, it is only different uh, in that legally rape is defined as non-consensual penetration uh, by a penis. In this case, the penetration was by way of fingers and tongue. It was perhaps even more alarming than the Wilson case, um, certainly in terms of the possible severity of sentence and also on the impact on case law in England and Wales. And later I'll draw out some of the relevant details of the case, um, but will mention that there's been another two that predate these, um, one in Scotland which did not result in a conviction and another from England which did. The latter also involved a defendant, um, Gemma Barker, um, who was reported as autistic too. Now there's been many big steps forward for trans legal protection in the last decade. And while the Equality Act of 2010 extends to everyone regardless of age, um, and gender identity is a protected characteristic under that law, it's only possible to get full legal recognition in the sex, gender a trans person feels themselves to be through the Gender Recognition Act. Uh, of 2004 when a person though is 18 and legally an adult. Now there's other limitations of the GRA not least of which it's still very much firmly rooted in a rigid binary model of sex and gender 
and indeed many trans people like myself choose not to be certificated by the state. But it's the serious nature of the legal interpretations of the Sexual Offences Act as it applies to emergent trans and gender variant young people that is most chilling to me and understandably throws up quite many questions and concerns for anyone working therapeutically with this vulnerable group of young people. And I want to explore this through the lens of a therapist looking at the development of trans identities in adolescent young people. Before I end, though, I will come back to what the current guidance is from the Crown Prosecution Service in dealing with cases of this nature. It's important that we do understand what the guidance says now that it's been reviewed after the McNally case. Now, adolescence for anyone is often a difficult and challenging time. For emergent trans young people, though, it is very usually a period of intense misery and acute crisis that can manifest itself in many different ways. Vicky Holt will have spoken about these yesterday, so please do hold them in your mind. It's important to remember, though, that the proportion of gender variant and trans um, young people um, who end up being treated at the TAVI are a very tiny fraction of the number of such young people who are out there in our towns, cities and rural areas. Most often they're completely isolated and without much tangible support around them. Many will not even be apparent to their peers, families and other adults around. So just how many young people are we talking about? Recent research from New Zealand indicates that about 1% of young people identify as transgender and 3% who are not sure. And there's no reason to believe um, why young people in Britain would be too different and indeed unpublished data from a 2012 survey in Cambridgeshire with all year 10 students in that county also indicates about 1% identify as transgender. So that means that there could be around 120,000 transgender children and young people under 16 and 360,000 who are not sure. So I bet that's a lot more than even those of you here may have imagined. Now there's a poverty of information about gender and sexual diversity in the school curriculum and a widely acknowledged paucity of quality sex and re relationship education, especially with regard to GSD issues. With many emergent trans young people likely to be afraid of speaking to their parents, other family members and friends, where are they going to find out the information about themselves? Well, they're going to head straight onto the internet and begin to find out. They are no different from other young people when they are exploring their identities, curious to seek connections, find like-minded friends and learn about themselves. And on the internet they will find sources of information, perhaps begin to connect tentatively with um, online forums and find out really what being trans is all about. And I see that myself on social media groups, young people as young as 13 who are beginning to form their identities reach out to others online because they've got nowhere else to turn. And once you see yourself reflected in others online, it's easier to make that first step of self-acceptance and perhaps even create a profile um, in the gender of your felt sense and begin to feel, you know, to discover what that feels like for you. And all of that can be done without a single person in your offline life knowing anything about it. But that incongruence between an online life and an offline one can also cause its own problems. These young people often carry an enormous stress and many share stories of intense emotional and psychological distress, acute anxiety, depression and other emergent um, mental health difficulties. Bullying is a common experience for many as they try and express their felt gender in some sort of tangible way offline. That can come from within families, from peers at school or in the community, from teachers, social workers and other adults around. It's a hard place to be in when you're also coping with all the other stresses that adolescence brings. It's tempting to imagine that all emergent trans young people would see themselves as needing support though and I don't actually think that's the case. Many young people just struggle on without asking for help. That's their normal. So adolescents will take many different pathways for different young people and there's no reason to surmise that all gender variant or trans young people would necessarily feel themselves to be so isolated or unconfident about other aspects of their lives. Even though many of the apparent trans young people do happen to present in that way. 
Therapists from different modalities um, can view the tasks of adolescence in different ways. But we could all agree that adolescence itself is a transition period between the dependent states of our childhood selves and the interdependent states of our adulthood selves. There are different ways of looking at how trans adolescents may navigate this journey towards identity formation. Now, more traditional psychodynamic explanations of adolescent identity formation tend to draw on Erickson's ideas. And Kroger in um, Identity and Adolescence, his 2005 book, I think, shows four stages. Um, the first is identity diffusion, a um, stage where a young person is not yet displaying any signs of commitment towards a set of beliefs or values. The second is identity foreclosure, where there is a premature identification with the beliefs and cultures that have been chosen um, by those around the young person. Third stage, the moratorium, where a young person involved in an active is involved in an active engagement with the search for possibilities of identity by experimenting with different options. Um, and it's seen as a necessary stage, um, you know, seen towards working towards a settled adult identity. And that fourth stage then is identity achievement, um, where a young person has a settled idea about who they want to be as an adult. Now there's of course much debate about whether or not these stages exist in this step-by-step -step manner or even if they are supported in research, especially given the extreme lack of research around trans adolescence. And in none of the works uh, around adolescence and that are the experiences of gender variant and emergent trans young people referred to at all. Person-centred therapists who are familiar with Mearns and Cooper's concept of configurations of self would see adolescent active experimentation with different identities as being very much a normal part of being and becoming, um, one that can be normalised and in therapy and, and continued into adulthood. Um, Daniel Siegel actually in his latest book Brainstorm identifies four features of adolescent brain growth, um, each of which has its upsides and its downsides, carrying benefits and risks. And I think they're pertinent to understand in the context um, that the trans adolescent and their emergent sense of self finds themselves in. So the first of these um, is novelty seeking, um, you know, with its upside as being open to change and living passionately with a sense of adventure. The downside being sensation seeking and risk taking that sometimes over -thrill, overplays the thrill and downplays the risk of dangerous behaviours impulsivity without thought for consequences. Second, social engagement. Um, the upside of that, creation of supportive relationships which are usually the best predictors of well-being and happiness throughout life. The downside being isolation from adults and or peers. Thirdly, increased emotional intensity. You know, the upside, it feels great to be alive, filled with positive energy and drive. The downside, intense but challenging, difficult feelings, impulsivity, mood swings, extremes of sometimes unhelpful reactivity. And fourthly, creative exploration. Um, the upside being sort of minimising feelings stuck in a rut and creatively exploring a diverse range of possible experiences. The downside being that search for meaning of life during teen years can lead to sort of crisis of identity, vulnerability to peer or family pressure, a lack of direction and purpose. So hold those in mind, um, but I now want to come back to the experience of McNally uh, and tell their account, but I'm going to change the names and use the case details from the public court records um, to explore through the lens of a trans-adolescent sort of identity development. So, Tom met Emma on a social networking game when he was 13 and Emma was 12. Tom had been born a girl but felt more comfortable interacting as male and this was the first step he had taken. No one else knew he was doing this. Tom and Emma developed a close and affectionate online relationship that developed into an adolescent romance. They communicated largely through MSN chat and then later via phone and webcam. They talked about getting married and having children. As they got older, the relationship developed into an exclusive romantic one and they began to have phone sex and spoke about what they wanted to do with each other sexually. 
Now Tom lived in Scotland and Emma lived in London so there was no question of them meeting physically until they were a bit older. And it was three and a half years before Tom did finally visit Emma. He was 17 by then and she was 16. He visited on four occasions, dressed as a boy and wore a packer of some sort. He stayed at the house of a family friend of Emma's. And over these four visits they did have sex, with Tom penetrating Emma vaginally with his fingers and tongue. He refused to let Emma touch him intimately, remaining clothed and it was in the dark. On the last visit, the family friend, while on the phone to Emma's mother, decided to look inside Tom's bag and discovered a bra and strap-on dildo. Emma's mother then challenged Tom about being a girl and told Emma. Tom then came clean, divulged his birth name, showed Emma his other Facebook profile and said he wanted a sex change. Emma was devastated, said that she felt physically sick and if Tom had told her from the start she wouldn't have judged him and that things might have been different. She was in shock and had lots of questions. The relationship ended although there was a brief limited communication between the two. But then Emma's mother then made a complaint to Tom's school and on admitting to the head teacher that sexual acts had taken place, the police were called. Emma then gave a full account of the acts to the police, in which one or two of her answers were said to be equivocal. But she did not know, she said, that Tom was a girl, that she considered herself heterosexual and had only consented to the acts, believing that she had done so with a boy. In Tom's account to the police, he said that Emma had found out about um, their real identity two years previously, and that they'd had a big argument, but had then started speaking again and had met up. The appeal court did not believe this because they saw Emma's purchase of condoms before Tom visited as evidence that she couldn't have known. Evidently, the court is not aware that condoms can also be used with dildos and prosthetic penises. As Tom was advised to plead guilty, there was no trial, and therefore no cross-examination of witnesses either Emma or her mother. Now Emma is also a young person and undergoing her own adolescent journey which is fraught with risk and uncertainty in the realm of teenage relationships. It's entirely possible that Emma, under pressure from her mother, felt shame as well as confusion and anger and retreated back into adopting her mother's values around gender and sexual difference. Perhaps she would not want to admit to her mum that she had become aware of Tom's gender history at an earlier stage once the crisis had resulted and the relationship was no longer seen as viable, or she may have been worried that she would have been rejected if she continued it. Now looked at through the prism of emergent adolescent um, identity formation, um, McNally's adoption of a male name and online persona um, can be seen as a normal part of identity experimentation for an emergent trans young person. The novelty-seeking reward of this at first age of 13 would have been reinforced by the strong feelings and connection he felt towards Emma as the relationship developed. The fact that Tom waited until Emma was 16 to meet physically in person could have been seen as him having a strong set of values um, around waiting for her to be of age of consent. On being confronted about his gender history as well, Tom decided um, or declared that he wanted to transition demonstrating that at 17 he did have some sort of identity achievement in the psychodynamic framework. He was clearly persistent in this over the course of some years and while he might not have considered the consequences of being discovered to this extent, he does not appear to have attempted to cover it up once exposed. Now, unlike the vast majority of sexual offenders I have encountered in my working life, Tom made a full admission of what had occurred at the first opportunity and appears from the records to have made no attempt to manipulate or fabricate his case to fit any defence. This indicates to me that he was genuine in believing that he was himself, being himself in his relationship, and was guilty of nothing more than his youth and in inexperience, in imagining there might not be the serious consequences to his behaviour. From his account he believed that Emma was already aware of his gender history. What's most upsetting about this case though is the comments of the initial sentencing judge who described McNally as selfish and callous, confused about their sexuality and a grave abuse of trust of her, 
her family and friends through behaviour over a number of years. The judge made them out to be some sort of predatory sexual offender. In particular, the abuse of trust is um, usually reserved for cases where there is a clear power differential of some kind, not in the case where two young people are of very similar ages. The initial sentence given was a three-year custodial sentence and for McNally to be on the sex offenders register for life. The pre-sentence report provided to the court revealed that McNally had been self-harming and was clearly distressed by the whole deeply exposing experience. At appeal, the court decided that there was no abuse of trust involved, although the appeal um, upheld the conviction on the grounds that withholding gender history vitiated the consent that Emma had given for the sexual acts to take place. McNally's sentence was therefore reduced to a nine-month um, custodial order suspended for two years, and they will be on the sex offenders register for ten years. I do not know what the outcome has been for this young person psychologically and how they now feel about their gender identity. I can only surmise that they will have been seriously traumatised by their experience and can only hope that they are now getting appropriate support. Sadly though, this might not be the case at all. I feel a tremendous sadness and anger at the way in which this young person has been treated by the criminal justice system and the rejection they faced when they were exposed. I can't help but wonder how they came to view what they might have seen as a model for their transition journey. Doing any research around transgender experience, it would be highly likely that they would have come across the notion of living stealth. In my experience, this is a commonly desired outcome for many young trans people, particularly young trans men. In the absence of affirming positive and open trans identities around them in their offline lives, with internalised transphobia and very real risks, Living stealth seems to be an attractive concept, more attractive than the risk of rejection or physical harm. When a young person is expressing themselves in their felt gender, they are not deceiving anyone. They are being true to themselves. In the aftermath of this case, the Crown Prosecution Service reviewed its guidelines around consent and around dealing with transgender subject, uh, suspects in allegations of this nature. Prosecutors are reminded of their duties under the Equality Act of 2010 and that they must apply the principles of the European Convention of Human Rights in accordance with the Human Rights Act 98 at each stage of the case. They are also reminded of their need to be aware of and sensitive to all relevant circumstances and ensure police supply as much information as possible to inform their decision. Um, for example, um, the suspect's position in relation to the Gender Recognition Act. Now, the CPS use both evidential and public interest considerations in deciding to proceed with prosecution. The evidential considerations, um, when considering the issue of consent, they now have to consider this McNally um, appeal court ruling that deception due to gender can vitiate consent. Whether there has been deception due to gender will require careful consideration of all the surrounding circumstances, including how the suspect perceives his or her gender, what steps, if any, he or she has taken to live as their chosen identity, what steps, if any, he or she has taken to acquire a new gender status. In the public interest considerations, um, they have to take into account whether the offending occurred as a result of the suspect's uncertainty or ambivalence around their gender identity, the nature and level of any relevant sexual activity, the nature and duration of any relationship between the suspect and the complainant, and where the suspect has made an admission whether an out-of-court disposal might take the place of a prosecution and provide appropriate response to the offender and or the seriousness and consequences of the offending. Those of us working with emergent trans adolescents face some difficult challenges as we deal with the aftermath of these cases. It's possible that we will see more prosecutions as it is somewhat inevitable that emergent trans young people will be seeking out ways to develop sexual relationships just like any other teenager. It seems harshly punitive to criminalise them for hiding aspects of themselves in ways in which other teenagers, and indeed adults do, in order to test out trust, acceptance and validation. 
other people do not face prison or many years on the sex offenders register for failing to, to disclose other aspects of themselves. For example, disability, ethnic background, sexuality, faith, socioeconomic status, or indeed any other aspect of them that might cause potential sort of like risk or problems. As therapists with GSD teenagers and adults, we need to be aware that we can often be often need to take on the role of educators. It's also possible that in future we might be called on to give evidence if any client themselves faces prosecution for similar issues. Safeguarding our clients can often feel like risk surfing, mirroring the process that our clients are undertaking when they are seeking out new relationships, especially sexual relationships. Referring on to specialist legal advice in cases like this is imperative. Few duty solicitors will have the experience and understanding of the nuances and sensitivity around trans young people's developmental processes. Press for Change is one organisation that clients will need to be advised to turn to if they face the nightmare, this nightmare themselves. But as with many trans community organisations, resources are hard pressed and there is no national network of trans aware criminal defence legal professionals. Luckily, there are some leading criminal law barristers like Dan Bunting uh, who have taken a special interest in the McNally case, so there is a rising awareness out there if it is starting from a very low level. Now, of course, what seems to underlay the very basis of the criminalisation is the notion that their sexual partners will be harmed by not knowing the gender history of the young person who has withheld it. Interestingly, this is also the under, underlying notion of harm that is at the heart of the automatic right of divorce for non-trans partners in a marriage to a trans person who has not disclosed. Alex Sharp, who's writing in the Modern Law Review, describes how this clause in the Gender Recognition Act serves to bolster the problematic notion that there is something of a yuck factor involved with sex with transgender people. We need to do everything we can to eliminate this yuck factor within society and also, at times, within ourselves. Thank you.